Um, yeah, we are here to talk to you about a lot of fun handcuff trickery today. I am Deviant from Tool. Along with me also from Tool is Dave Plochet, Dr. Tran, the Dashing Secret Agent. And as a special benefit, we also have Ray, one of our German friends from the sport picking groups overseas. Came, he came all the way from Germany. Let's give him a hand, guys. We have a lot of good things that we're going to show you, but especially, let's get right to our featured speaker first. <laughs> Okay, hi. I was asked to talk about a few things we did in Europe with handcuffs because there's somewhat difference there. One of the f most, I think, funny things actually happened last year at Haar because the Dutch police, which is the country where the Haar takes place, has a very special kind of handcuffs. This is completely different from all the cuffs you will find in the US and it has a special key. So it's shaped differently than all the keys you know. And they're very proud of that. And so they're carrying these around all the time and they were running around on the campground where we, all these hackers were. And one thing about the key is that they won't sell the handcuff to anybody. And as I collect sort of handcuffs, I don't really like that because they won't sell it to me, selling, ah, we can't sell it, the key is so secret. But they have hanging it on their belt. <laughs> the top secret key. And it hasn't changed for years, what I can say. So it's the same key, but it's just still considered secret until, until har. So what we did is we used the 3D printer to replicate it. <laughs> Taking the measurements from a key we got somewhere. Printing it on our CD 3D printer and coming with the 3D printed key to Har. So as you saw on the previous slide, we approached the police guys there and like, oh, we printed your secret handcuff key. <laughs> Can we try it on your cuffs? <laughs> of course they were going, no, 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 this is a secret key, you don't have it. No, oh, we have it, so just try it out. No, no, no. Take it, this would go to your van and try it there. Don't tell us. And oh my god! Oh my god! Everybody! Does anybody have handcuffs? So you see, As you were saying. even the ninjas are afraid of the Dutch handcuffs. <laughs> okay, but the policemen were just afraid of our key, so they're running away. No, we don't take it, we won't try it. We said, you can have one, try it alone, don't tell us. We just wanted to n let you know that we did that, because your key is now public. But they didn't want to. Fortunately, later on, the older one wasn't there, the younger ones didn't know. <laughs> And we actually were able to try it. And surprisingly, it really worked. Woot! Yeah. So for all of those who ever are going to travel to a hacker camp in Holland or something, just download your copy of the key. Oops. At key.nu, with a dot after the E. So you can get an STL model there, you can get all the measurements from it, and you can print it on these 3D printers which are getting more and more popular. Yeah, so that's the thing about the, these Dutch keys. If you search on the internet for 3D printer handcuff key, you will find some, quite some coverage, some of them funny, some of them a little crazy. <laughs> Go search for it. So, another thing I'm currently working on, because this Dutch key is almost a year old, but this is not completely finished. Watch on Kinu for the final. We found out that there's actually an airline restraint kit featuring another very unusual cuff 
because it's using um, English cuff. It's called the Chub Detainer Cuff by the Chub Company. Lock pickers will know the Chub Company for high security locks, like in safes and everything. The handcuff isn't that high security, but still very, very hard to pick. You have to have real lock picking skills, three lever manipulation, and everything. But it's a very solid keyway. So I'm pretty sure we'll have a working model for that airline restraint kit in plastic. <laughs> <laughs> so you can go through the metal detector visit with any problems. So watch out on the door for these to appear. Yeah. Okay, another thing about the Dutch cuffs, if you happen to be there and don't have the key with you, we have a, last, a short video for you to see what else you can do with them if you have high-tech tools like, for example, paper with you. <laughs> So the paper basically blocks the mechanism and the cuff slide open. I have to warn you so that this won't work if it's correctly operated and double locked on both hands. So probably try to run away before both sides are double locked. <laughs> Well, that's an interesting fact, though. When uh, when people see that video, they usually say, "Oh, aren't those like, those big, heavily engineered handcuffs? How can you slip out of something with simple as paper?" Well, a lot of cuffs, actually, big, heavy-duty cuffs. Their security isn't in their anti-pick resistance or manipulation resistance, like these German cuffs by the Cluso company. They are really just designed to kind of almost be like leg irons and hand irons. They're not really designed to be unpickable cuffs. Many of you have seen these cuffs as well, by the way. How many, how many people have ever watched uh, you know, Firefly or seen Serenity? When River goes fucking nuts from the Odie Bar commercial, these are the cuffs they lock her up with on the ship, man. So you've all seen Clayuso Model 13s before. What you've probably never seen, though, is that same kind of a trick, that same sort of a shimming trick. You can do that on these. Again, similar cuff, big heavy cuff, but if you have something like a sticker... Do I have a sticker sitting up here? I do. Can you still hear me? So if you have, let's say, a, like a sticker paper backing, because that works well, dollar bills work well, sometimes that paper is just thin enough to slip in underneath the teeth here, but thick enough to still trip the levers. So if I can slip it under, or I just shred the paper. Yeah, let me just flip it around one last time. <laughs> Demo fail. If you have uh, dollar bills you don't mind shredding up, you can usually do it with that too. I don't know if you can see it, but... It works really well with European currency since they tend to be more plastic. Yeah, European currency, Australian currency especially. Have you ever tried to rip Australian currency in half? You actually can't do it. <laughs> yeah, it's like Tyvek. But a lot of those big cuffs, you know, they're also pickable. Someone will see the actual keys that come with them. They look real serious. But here's one of our locksmith buddies just popping open those same heavy-duty cuffs, and he's actually picking them at a tool meeting with something that's smaller than a regular handcuff key. So just because a, a cuff looks really big and angry or just because the key it comes with looks really huge, it doesn't mean that it's in any way really that pick-resistant. Well, let's talk more about uh, just typical cuffs, because we're throwing all these weird foreign cuffs at these people, and they may have never seen the inside of just regular cuffs before. Would you like to go over that? Absolutely. So uh, here we have a cutaway of a simple handcuff design. Um, this is the type that will be employed by uh, United States law enforcement. And uh, very, very straightforward. There are not a lot of complex moving parts. And again, as we'll talk further on, a uh, handcuff is not designed for to be a high security restraint. It's just designed to you know, keep someone situated while uh, pr particularly doing transport. Cool. Um, not many moving parts. You see you've got the ratcheting arm there in blue, and you've got the pawl at the bottom. Both of those have ridges that interlock with each other, and that just keeps it from moving in and out when you have the cuff in moving outwards, I should say. And then there's a spring that holds the pawl up so that it engages the ratcheting arm. There's also the double lock bar, and when that is engaged, you're not able to tighten the cuff or unlock it with the key unless you flip the key around the other way. One of the main purposes for that, for this, is to protect law enforcement from lawsuits and claims of abuse. Because if they, if you ever catch someone who doesn't double lock their cuff, 
um, if someone is you know a little crafty, what they might do is really slam that down, crunch it up, and you know get black and blues all over their arm and say, "Listen, I was being abused by this cop." Um, so that's the, the main purpose for that, and you'll see that very rarely will law enforcement officers not double lock a cuff. And that's really it. Just very straightforward. Not many moving parts again, and not not a complicated mechanism. Okay. We've got a couple of videos here. We're going to show you. Yeah, you can keep. It's it's what you've said. Yeah. You know, it's it's not a lot going on in there. Yeah, the mechanism itself is a real simple to understand thing. As you can you know visualize this, there's not much going on in the cuff. The parts that move don't move very far, and even getting the paw to trigger down, you're just talking about you know fractions of an inch worth of movement. So obviously there's a lot of ways you could reach in there without the proper key and still trigger this sort of movement. And hopefully if uh, you know we don't look too dumb up here, we're going to show you some of those ways. For example, like a shimming attack. Shimming is the use of really thin metal inserted somewhere into a lock mechanism. You can insert thin bits of metal in one side or another on the outer edge of the cuff body and still try to get at that paw. Now the side you just saw someone pushing on, that's hard to do unless you over tighten yourself. This side over here, it's easier to slip a shim underneath because the teeth are going the right way, but of course really tight cuffs, you're not always going to just get into that side. But almost, I'd say almost every cuff we have on this table, probably with the exception of some Korean ones, could be shimmed like that. And really quickly, just in case you didn't understand it, that double lock mechanism, that bar underneath here. Normally, it's out of the way, the key or a shim or a pick or any number of other things would allow the ratcheting paw arm to move, but if that bar clunks over, now nothing can move. The paw can't move, you can't shim it, you can't even use a key properly. The only way to get in, as Dave pointed out, is to bring a key around the other side. And if you see with our hands out of the way of this next shot, coming around the other way, click, will pop that double lock bar out. Of course, there are other ways of popping the double lock bar out, and uh, you know we're going to come back to that in a second. First, though, just so they know we're not completely uh, telling tales out of school here, should we try some shimming and, and picking attacks and the like? You guys want to see this? See us break out of handcuffs? First, we'll try to use some uh, some handcuff shims. Now, there are real, you know, proper shims like from Sear Pick and those guys, or you can just use tension tools and, and things like that and try to shim out. Should we do the video? No, we'll just yeah do it on camera here. So who's up first? Go. The dashing secret agent. Which, which mic? You just one? shout. You'll, you'll be heard. So for these handcuffs, I'm going down the side that has a split. So I'm st I, have a t I have a tension tool here, just from a lockpick set. I'm wedging it underneath the paw, if you can see. And I'm just pressing down. Power Bang. Cops. Bang. Yeah. Uh, I have some little more expensive cuffs here from the Smith Lesson Company using a very, very thin standard tensioning tool and I go to the side with the ratchets. So one thing you have to do when doing that is, is it feasible? Push in the ratchet a little with the, with the tool. So I'm pushing the, pushing the uh, bow in a little when putting in the shim. Then it gets between the ratchet and it open. Oop. Nice, very nice. I'm just going for the same thing Robert just did to reiterate and so you know there aren't any trick cuffs. Um, these, you just go in from the back here, push in down. This is a standard tension wrench. You can use any bent piece of metal, really. And then I'm just going to push down and it's open. So how about picking? Because we can pick out of these cuffs too, right? Yeah. Shall we show them some picking attacks as well? You guys want to see some picking attacks? Yeah, no, make it. Go ahead, doctor. What do you got there? Just a, just a regular pair of, uh, of valors. One way of telling which direction you need to pick is looking for the fulcrum where the paw is going to be uh, pivoting on. So you can actually see the rivet here, right on the handcuffs. So you know this paw is going to be flexing this way. So what you want to do is use your pick tool to just reach in there and just try to press down on the paw. 
don't do this with really nice picks, picks you just bought, let's say, because sometimes it'll it'll trash the pickup pretty good. We'll often see us, you know, we'll grab paper clips or safety pins. Those kind of things, you know, how many people have ever hated lock picking in the movies? Like when someone doesn't have a tension error, they're like, oh, look, the door fell open, and it's all fake. The cuffs, actually, sometimes in the movies, it is kind of like that. It's just, you know, a little shitty piece of metal. Picks are bad. Yeah, destroying the pick. That's all right. A little thin piece of metal in the right place. You're just trying to catch a simple paw lever. Remember, notice how big the bit is on the end of a typical handcuff key. It doesn't have a lot of huge reach down into the cuff. You're just trying to reach just barely, barely, barely inside the keyway, and you should be able to trip that lever. Um, another really common tool, you can use a lot of common things like bobby pins, paper clips, and other stuff to pick a, a um, uh, you know, pick handcuff locks, even the standard ones or some of the higher end ones. But I don't know if you guys have ever seen the binder clips you can get at Staples, where you can pinch the two pieces and then you flip it around and you clip on paper. Well, there's one particular size that works awesome, and you can pinch it and release that little silver piece, bend it open, and it makes an awesome handcuff key. So um, some people may or may not clip those on their belts every day as they go out. But if you, I mean, in all actuality though, if you're in a non-violent protest and for no reason you get scooped up and someone's not looking, I mean, it might be a handy way to get out. Or like China or someplace. Of course, yeah, US, absolutely, absolutely. They would never do but, that. Uh, you don't fuck around with cops. Or if you're unlawfully restrained. I mean, criminals do use handcuffs too. Here's a binder clip right there. there yes, indeed, binder clip. That'll work very well. So wow, how are we doing on time? We gotta keep moving along a little bit. Shall we try to, you know what, ask us in the Q&A room if you wanna see uh, popping out of double locks or ask us up in the lock pick village. We can, we can actually pick out of the double lock, but you're gonna learn even more other double lock techniques in a minute possibly here. My favorite video escape, by the way, I just love to throw this in anytime I'm doing a handcuff talk. Uh, how many people know Renderman? Yeah. Renderman is a really, really skinny, really flexible fellow. And uh, he is able to do this, sometimes at parties, sometimes at, you know, Fed conferences and the like. It's funny that I mentioned Fed conferences because here as Jackalope cuffs him up, I've been told by my FBI buddies this video actually gets shown at Quantico now during trainings. Actual Renderman here. Just, you know, he's like, all right, so I'm going to get cuffed up here. You know, you got me going, you got me done up pretty well behind the back. I'm all in place. He's like, okay, here I am. No, nothing up my sleeves, nothing in my pockets, no special trickery. Just a little bit of light diet. Push him up my wrist a little and go zip, 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 wham. <laughs> And of course, that trademark fedora of his always has his tools and everything and his picks up inside the brim. I think he keeps a flash drive with a backtrack install up there. So yeah, way to go, Renderman. So, how are we on time? We're, we're not bad on time. That double lock, though. Well, we keep talking about how the double lock should be a, a secondary mechanism that's kind of hard to, to attack and mess around with. Uh, there are some physics involved, however, that can be exploited. Tran, you want to talk some more about that? Yeah, sure. So as mentioned before, the double locking bar is a metal bar that when you use the, the little, the little uh, post on the end of a handcuff key to push that bar across, that bar will prevent the paw from moving up and down. You can either pick that open, or you can use a little bit of physics. Does everyone know who that is? I think my dad. Exactly, the apple. Isaac Newton. Next. There's something called the whack attack. <laughs> because that bar is made of metal and has mass, everyone knows objects in motion want to stay in motion. So what you can do is actually whack the handcuff. And, cause, and the momentum or the inertia of that double locking bar will want to continue moving. So if you whack it in the right direction, you can just pop it back into the reset position. And I'll try to demo that real quick. Yeah. Who saw my, my very first DEF CON talk ever at DEF CON 13, was it? Agent X did this on stage. Anybody see that? Yes. Wow, some old timers here. So, you want to hold the mic? So here's a pair of handcuffs that are not double locked. You can tell by it because it's, you can tighten it. What you do is use the end of a handcuff key. There's a little post on the end. Just click it in. Oh, this one's broken. Yeah, use the other side. Just be gentle with it. These are yours. Yeah, They're both yeah. My, mine are fucked up, dude. When you bang them too many times, it's like bumping a lock. Eventually, it's just, it's just dead. I'll just use these pink. I'll just use these pink handcuffs. That was what you really wanted all along, wasn't it? 
Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I made these myself. <laughs> so using the post at the end of the key, I just engaged the double lock. The handcuff is not going to tighten at all. All you have to do is smack it against something really hard like a uh, padlock or an anvil or, or a rock. You know, like the anvil you keep in your pocket all the time. <laughs> And now you can over yeah, you can over tighten. Yeah. Very very nice. So he just unset the double lock just by smashing down really hard. Physics, it works, bitches. <laughs> now there are other handcuffs that try to uh, they have countermeasures for this. One way of doing that is to have a plastic piece. The plastic piece doesn't have enough mass for you to when you whack it. It doesn't have the same inertia, so it's not going to move. So that's one way of doing it, using plastic. And then there's another technique uh, that the, the Yule handcuffs, one of our favorite handcuffs, they utilize. There's almost no mass in that double locking bar. And in fact, the double locking bar and the spring is the same piece of metal. So there's almost no mass right there. And it's v extremely difficult. Actually, I don't think that we've ever been able to no. use the whack attack to unset the double lock. No, we never have. Yeah, we're, we're going to come back to Yule's a little later. They really are probably our favorite cuff ever. Yeah. Who has seen these handcuffs before? Who knows, who knows what a medical lock is? Yeah. A medical lock is actually a very high security lock. I think one of the best brands here in the US. And they actually put one of those on a handcuff. So for picking, you're a bit out of luck with those. <laughs> but as a company, you should be a little careful with on what cuff you put your high security medical lock on. Because what they used here is a standard peerless handcuff which is basically what we see before. So we have this high-end locking cylinder on it. So here we have again a, a double, a not now double locked cuff. You actually need a special tool to double lock it because they put this clumsy lock on it. So I'm applying the double lock just the normal way. So now it's locked. And I strand it before. Oops. Okay. I should have used mine. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to break my cuffs. He can break his own, though. Because that housing is just high, high impact plastic. But it is just plastic. You could crack it off. You can use yours. Actually, the ones you have, is that a metal housing on the Desmo one? Oh, this is the same design with the Desmo locks. This is a European lock. And it's used on many of the slot machines. So you can tell it's, I would say, even more secure than the Medico. So let's try it with this one here. Oops, that's a demo effect, I guess. Yeah, okay. There we go. So it took... It took us three efforts, okay. But you see, we opened the double lock without using this high security lock at all. And now we can shim it. So this $200 cuff has basically the same security as any other one. <laughs> So there was also another thing you were going to tell us about cuffs you brought with us, right? And regarding that double lock trickery with the German cuff. Yeah, that's another double lock fail. You see, in Germany, we have ba usually basic normal cuff with a slightly different key, but it's the set principle is basically the same. This one here has been used in the past, I think, until 2005 or something, and they're still around. So they stopped making them now, but they're still around. And it's for, for 20 years or something, those were around. And the nice thing about this is that they are the only cuff that I know of that's in police use which you can escape from without any tool at all. <laughs> <laughs> I won't show it on hand because the demo is so effective in the last time, but okay. let's see. So what I'm, what I'm doing is, you, you remember the pictures from before? Here's the double lock. You can activate it with the fingers. It's actually clever design, so the police officer doesn't have to use the top of his handcuff key. He can just activate the double lock like this. But what I do is, by pushing in the bow a little, like almost a complete click, but not really. So it moves down the ratchets as far as possible, and then put in the double lock. Push in, push it in, in even more. So the double lock goes against the ratchets and holds them down, and the cuffs open. <laughs> So 
So this, of course, again, is possible if the double lock hasn't been engaged before, but the slamming or ramming just works nice on these. So slam them open, use the double lock, and escape without any tool at all. Very nice. Oh, but now they have new ones. <laughs> yeah. But don't be too afraid, those new ones, oh, oh yeah. to skip them. This is a very difficult design. They have a three-bitted key, and they're very expensive and everything in sort. This will be the ultimate handcuff ever. But they had a nice design floor again. The three-bitted key use, is used on the pawls, but it's not used on the double lock, and there's no shim protection. So actually, you can open them like the other one. So if you go to Germany and are on some bad guys have the cops' cuffs. <laughs> because German police, of course, never, never would uh, cuff you unlawfully. So don't be afraid too much to go to Germany, either German without a tool or with the normal tools. <laughs> Do you want to show the one last three-bitted uh, fail on the Kyung Changs as well, the next slide? Oh, yeah, and we have another fail because we, I think you will be talking about the Kyung Changs with the three poles, the normal ones. But they also make a very good one, which even is better than the German three pole one because it has the sheets of metal reaching up to the bow. So you can't shim it because there are three parts. You need a three-bitted shim, and who has a three-bitted shim who can improvise one in seconds? But one nice thing we found out, I think two years ago or something, and published it on the Congress as a zero-day exploit for handcuffs. <laughs> I think that in Korea they still know, don't know it because they don't watch our videos. There's one little glitch. If you do the same thing which I did with the Cleuso just, like pushing in the bow almost a click, then the three poles appear here without the sheets between. So you can put in a straight tool, hold them down, and escape from the cuff. So just in case you get encounter one of those, be sure to know that. Very, very awesome. Are we glad Ray made the journey over here to talk about some of this? So if all these uh, these techniques for having you know better cuffs kind of fail, how do they make you know how do police around here try to deal with the idea of oh I want a better quality cuff? The two most common brands you're going to see in the U.S. Um, but by far is going to be the most popular is going to be the Smith and Wesson, and then Peerless also are going to be pretty popular as well. Uh, Republic Arms and then Safari Land you'll see around the world. But it all comes down to money for a lot of these things. So if you're going to spend less money on manufacturing, you're not going to get as high a quality of product most of the time. So these are just a little better made. Just like any other lock, they have less tolerances, and the less tolerance you have, the easier, um, uh, you know, the harder it is rather to exploit the lock. And then here are some examples of some of the higher end locks here. Now, as you guys know, if you've ever done any lock picking, you know, up in the lock pick village, a higher quality lock doesn't always mean, you know, it's unpickable. It just means you have to try a little harder. So that thin shim technique that Ray was showing earlier, where you actually have to insert the shim and seat it kind of deeper by clicking yourself tighter, you can do that on high quality cuffs like Smith & Wesson and Peerless, if you're lucky and if you're not too drunk on camera here. But yeah, I can sink a shim down. I just have to over tighten myself. And you can still get out of those. And, and that's open. That's what a standard cops can use in Vegas. So if the, even those sort of techniques kind of fail, if the idea of, oh, like, you know, we'll just make it tighter tolerance, if that still doesn't buy you complete protection, if someone knows any of these tricks, what do they actually do in reality to make a standard cuff better? Well, usually what they wind up doing is putting multiple paws in. Ray had touched on this a second ago. Do you want to shim or key me out of that side? Because I'm feeling kind of like a douche up here. So putting in multiple paws, like Dave could reach in and pick this right now, because again, it's, it's a heavier cuff, but it only has one paw. This kind, so you know, like a Hyatt's brand or an ASP, a Chicago handcuff. Can you guys see that? There are actually two paws in there. Now you might be able to shim that, thank you, pretty effectively, but you can't reach in with like a pick or a paper clip or something like that. You might trip one paw, but not the other. And the same thing is carried even further with other brands that use like triple paws. A lot of Hyatt's cuffs from the UK have these, the Kyung Chang's from Korea. So again, multiple paws trying to reach in. Hitting some, you might not hit all of them. The Yules, oh, Tran, tell, tell us them, tell them just about how badass the Yules take this. So we mentioned that just because you have multiple paws doesn't makes it harder to pick, but doesn't necessarily make it harder to shim. Well, the Yule handcuffs, they went completely crazy with these this design. They basically put a metal 
a metal blade in between the uh, the shim, so you would need a split shim to get in there. They went even further. They have these flanges that crimp over, and these ridges. So when you even if you had a multi-tipped shim, those flanges will direct the tips of those shims against a ridge or an edge. It can, that those sh the, sh the shim you stick in there will never reach those paws. And also that metal blade going down goes through the entire um, body of the, the handcuff too. So your key has to have a split in it to be able to reach around through the, uh, the blade. Yeah, the Yule cuffs, are, they're some of the nicest we'd ever seen. And for quite a while, we couldn't get out of them. None of our friends could get out of them. Uh, you know, even like CP and the 949 guys, who are usually some of the nicest handcuffed people you'll see, like banging around parties with a bunch of cuffs on their arms, they frustrated these guys too. We didn't think anyone was going to be able to pick or manipulate their way out of Yules. I was impressed when some, you know, private, scary security contractor type guys from One Point Tactical were at my house one day and they said, oh, you know, I've seen, I've heard of these. These are kind of cool. And with enough tinkering, you know, one one fellow named Phil, he was actually able to pick out. Now, he wasn't wearing them at the time, but it was a wonderful proof of concept where he said, all right, I've got this you know, bent piece of paper clip, and he just had to size it right, and he got that to reach in around the blocking blade and trip both levers. So we were like, yeah, whoa, we were all impressed, and let's celebrate, woo-hoo, so way to go, Phil. Now, it's not a crazy high-tech attack, but it's definitely one of the coolest things, you know, I, had, I didn't think that would be possible, and that's, that's why it pays to have really scary friends who are willing to just try it. Be like, no, fuck it, I'm, I'm just going to give it a try anyway. And sometimes you wind up with a cool attack like that. Now, I should point out, Yule takes it even further with their Pro Series, their Deluxe Series. In addition to having really nice uh, silicone lining around the inside, so you don't need the fuzziness if you want to have some fun with these, <laughs> they also you know, have a much tighter keyway. It's at a canted angle. If you're wearing these proper cuffed you know, palms out, there's almost no way you're going to get into that tight keyway. They have major shim protection now. They've even added basically what we call a crushing wheel. It's a, it's a spinning gear in the front that the Paul can just ride across. Cross. But imagine slipping a shim in there, it'll just chew up and destroy, the shim will not get anywhere because of this grinding wheel. It is, again, just the, the fucking latest Yules, the Deluxe Series Yules, are probably the, the nicest cuffs I've ever seen. And they're, they're, they're heavy-duty aluminum alloy. So they're heavy-duty, but they're not heavy. You can carry them like we you know, are usually carrying a bunch of cuffs around, and by the end of the day, it feels like your shorts are falling off. Not with the Yules. They, they, they really do think of everything. All right, um, what was that? Oh, yes, one more. If you know, like, crazy, you know, private security contractors from Iraq and stuff, they, they will teach you a lot of really, really wicked shit, man. Um, this, is, this is Kelly, one of the other guys from On Point. And has anyone ever heard of, like, Kelly, or have you ever seen any of these guys come around the show? Every now and then, when you see uh, the seer pick guys, the seer pick, the, this, you know, evasion and escape. Anybody do any seer training? No, they won't admit it. There's, there's, there's like, operators in the room, but they're just not going to raise their hands. So they will occasionally show you this trick, and we don't like doing it because if it doesn't work, it really, really hurts. And it, you know, we're out 50 bucks even if it does work. Yeah. But um, has anyone ever heard of just handcuff breaking? Not like you know, crazy. You know, I'm a super strong man, like in the circus kind of handcuff breaking. Just, just leveraging physics, just being able to make the chains bind up. Because you know how some cuffs are hinged. A lot of departments have moved to that. In fact, when I was in Australia, cuff cops were looking at the cuffs like, oh, yeah. Here, can you hold this for a second? So this one, um, this one cop is like, oh, yeah, you've got, those, you've got those cuffs. Yeah, you're coming from America, right? And he starts doing this. And I'm like, oh, I know what you're talking about there. Yeah, handcuff breaking is when you can twist the chains around and try to get them to lock up on themselves. And then when the chains can't move and the eyelet can't swivel correctly, you can actually just crunch down. If you catch it just right, you can try to snap the chain or snap the eyelet off. And if it works... This. Right? Oh, yeah, show, show. Yeah, so right now, the links are bound together. If I were to snap any harder, this chain would probably break, especially since these are, this is aluminum. Yes. And depending on the model of cuffs, they may bind differently. Sometimes, on some cuffs, the links will even loop over the eyelet, which, which makes it even easier. So you're going to try it? I'm going to maybe try it. I don't know. <laughs> if we can try it. What do these cuffs cost? Do you think? Oh, I don't want to think about it, man. I've broken a few of these when I've... Uh... <laughs> I've broken a few of them before. If you can keep trying to twist them around... 
they're almost in a spot. No. What I did, you know, like in baking shows, where they're like, there's one I made earlier. What, they'll, what guys will do, if you go to the sear pick table, these diamond saw blades, these like little diamond file here, if you go inside the chains and you rough up the chains, you can sometimes get them to bind up on themselves. And I'd really like, maybe if I can do it in one hand. Let me, let me try it one handed here. You're picking out of one side. Because I just, I don't want to sit here twisting them all day. So the idea, the idea is to get the chain up on itself. If you can get the chain up on itself and not let it twist around any further, I can just kind of manually swing it into position almost. Oh, I don't know if it's going to go. I don't think it's going to go. Uh, Want to keep talking while I just keep trying to fuck with this over here? I want to try it. If we've got a quick second, um, would you want to tell the story? No, I'm not buying the story. Okay, good. Okay. okay. Uh, I've got it. I've got it twist right. around. And if I uh, really don't want to hurt my wrist here. And they're open! That, that kind of hurts. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, you, you want to talk about how... Uh, how <laughs> I'll be all right in a second. I just need more whiskey. Um, so yeah, variations in designs, different sizes of cuff can start to happen when you start introducing all these different features, like sizing the pawl differently, sizing a different pack of pawls. Imagine you know, a cuff body that's really narrow, like this one here, but a key that might be from another brand of cuff, where let's say there are multiple pawls. If you have a key, thank you, that's too wide, this key is not going to turn in that cuff at all. You guys understand that? It'll fit in the keyway. Whew, devil but it won't actually be able to move. Now, that we run into that sometimes, especially when there's like a sea of cuffs on a table, like all of our collections. And we're like, oh man, which key went to which cuff? Here, I'll get you out of those if someone's stuck in the lockpick village. And we're like, oh, wait a minute. No, I can't get you out of those. Wait, who's got a different key over here? That happens. And it became such a problem for law enforcement that a lot of law enforcement supply catalogs started offering what they would call universal keys. And usually these were just keys where the bit was cut down. Or oftentimes I think they were just keys that failed quality control and the bit was like way too small. So then they're like, hey, we could sell these as universals. All right, it'll turn, it'll always fit no matter how small the cuff is. Well, that's fine. That'll work really well. But remember, cuffs that have multiple paws, like, you know, Yules, or not, yeah, Yules would have multiple paws, like this Kyung Chang in this video, especially, those triple paws, when there's a lot of slop in there. Can you guys see this? This is a universal key trying to operate the Kyung Chang, and it's catching some of the paws, but not all of them at different times. So some go down, others don't. So it's probably not going to release these. And sometimes it can even, write, it'll slip like in between the paws, or slip on, and then you're, it'll like eat the key. That happened like two years ago. This poor kid, we're trying to close up the lockpick village. And he comes up to me, he's like, hey, man, can you help me out? I'm like, oh, sure. Man. He's like some 12-year-old kid, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you got stuck in those? Yeah, you need to, need to be shown how to get out of them? He's like, no, no, I was in your lesson. I show, you guys showed me. I'm like, oh, what happened? He's like, well, you know, I, I tried this key, and the key won't move. Nothing will move. And I went, oh, shit. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he didn't have to go home with them on his arm. We eventually, like, snapped the key off and then put a new key in. But uh, we, we kind of had an idea. We said, all right, this is a problem, the idea that you can't just carry around a single key that'll always work, even though they're all the same universal form factor. We said, all right, what if at our last tool meeting of 09, the Christmas meeting, I said, everyone, bring your cuffs. We're going to Ed's shop. Ed has a billion cuffs, almost as many as Ray, maybe. I said, all right, everyone bring your cuffs. I'll bring mine. Everyone bring all the cuffs we've got. Scatter them on a table. Measure all the cuffs. Measure all the keys. Measure them really precisely and start to chart out exactly how all these numbers crunch down. We said, if we look at, because the key is like four dimensions. You know, the shaft has a thickness and the bit has a height and a width. If we chart all these numbers together and compare everything, including a few brands that need that split, do any patterns start to appear? Do any ranges and tolerances start to appear? 
as it turns out, yes, they do. And there is kind of like a Goldilocks style ideal key. We were able to find one. It absolutely can be workable. And now we can open up basically every kind of cuff that we have in this standard handcuff key form factor. So starting out, you know, here are those crazy uh, three Paul Kyung Changs, which are one of the hardest ones that are always a problem. Sure enough, works on those. How about the peerless ones that are popular for a lot of police departments? This is a colorized model 700. Works on those. How about the new generation, the cheap peerless PO10s that are now fabricated in Korea? Works on those. How about old brands that aren't even really used much anymore? These are Winchesters. Works on those. I think this is a pair of maybe Chicago cuff company cuffs. Bang, works on those. Here is a pair of Smith & Wessons. Again, another really popular one. Here's the cheap little Valors. The Valors that are such a pain in the ass that never, no one likes to work with, you know? I think we have a pair of one of the Korean Yules just there. South African company, Republic Arms, works on those. Next beyond that, I think, is the British by RBS. No, I'm sorry, this is the ASP, used by a lot of tactical teams. ASP cuffs, works on those. British cuffs from the Hyatt's company and the RBS company. Hyatt's has now become Safari Land, based out of the US, works on those. Does it work on the Scotland Yard RBS rapid cuffs? Yes, it does, works on those. We just kept going down the line, and even Ray now giving us some German police issue cuffs, works on those. It works on everything. And now, if you want to have one, well, this is the key. It's not really hard to make this. All we found is that you need tolerances of machining. You need to really be precise within about, I'd say, a tenth of a millimeter or less. If you can machine things really close to these dimensions, you can absolutely have a key that fits in all these cuffs. You've got to be a little careful occasionally. Those triple paw cuffs, you have to be kind of right in the middle manually. It won't perfectly seat on its own, but it's narrow enough to work everywhere. What? The outer diameter of the uh, shaft, uh, 3.5 millimeter. The inner diameter, 2.9. The blade itself should be 5.5 tall, and it should be between 2.9 and 3.0 wide, with a 0.3 millimeter split down the very middle of the blade. On the website, too? Yes, this will all be on the web. This is probably in your slide deck on the presentation CD. Now, what we published this for is because even though Tool did this research and we patented it, we only plan on maybe selling this to law enforcement if there's an interest in the market. We have no care if any of you want to do this on your own. We completely believe in Creative Commons and you know, copy left. If you want to make these, please do. If you want to make these and you want to come up to the Lockpick Village, we have a ton of a certain type of key that is ideal. If you look at this chart and start saying, all right, I need a key that's this wide, this tall, with these dimensions, immediately some keys get knocked off the list because they're just not the right starting dimension. They're too big, or I'm sorry, they're too small in some ways. Ultimately, the Kyung Chang and the Smith & Wesson key are the only real suitable candidates for getting this key to be you know, something you could shave down. But look how much metal you'd have to take off the Kyung Chang compared to a Smith & Wesson, really the Smith & Wesson key, the new style Smith & Wesson key, is freaking perfect. You have to narrow the bit slightly. It's already the right height. Then you drop a cut down the middle of it, and right there, there it is. We have these Smith & Wesson keys up in the village. We brought our calipers. We brought our Dremel tools. And just freaking go at it. Make your own and then try it in like every one of these cuffs that we got here and see if you did a good job. And if you want, you can take one of these home from DEF CON this very year. Yeah, is there anything else that we forgot to add? Any, of, any other tips we wanted to say there? That key, is that the thick one? The question was, is that key the new thick key? Yes, yeah, the one that has a thicker head stamped Smith & Wesson right on it. I want to add that be careful with handcuff keys. Some states, they're illegal to have if you are arrested. If you're arrested and have a handcuff key on you, you have to tell the police officer you have a handcuff key and have to take it away, or it's an automatic felony. Yeah, Florida. Florida's one place you will become an automatic FARC headline. <laughs> I think we have five minutes for questions. Yeah. So we even saved a little time for que like one or two questions here, and then we'll go into the Q and A room and, and follow it up and do a lot of hands on. Yeah, man. The key with the uh, the split down there. Um, I don't understand how that works with the triple paw. 
the question was, does the split key, how does that work with the triple Paul? It's what the, the split is small enough that you're never going to like lose the middle Paul through the split. So it functions just as a wide enough bit to be able to trip all triple Paul, all three Pauls if you center it. So you'll barely be catching the edge of the outer Paul and the outer Paul and the middle Paul is just hit by both sides of your split bit. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, that's, he, was, he was thinking about the three poles with a blade, but this is only this one Kyung Chang I showed earlier. This is blades, it won't work on those, but these are not used, and as you see, put in a little and use a, a straight tool and push them all down. <laughs> so. Yeah, and like the ASPs that you need a split, you need the cut in the ASPs, you need the cut in the Yule, but our key works in those. Yeah, a ASP has a three pole one without blades and a two, po two pole one with blade. So it works in both. Yeah, it works either way. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys assessed the uh, Gotcha handcuffs? Uh, BetterHandcuffs.com. Oh, the Gotcha handcuffs are not on the market. This company is basically out of business, so don't be afraid of them. I'd really love to see them show up from a collector's point of view. They have a something round-shaped key with an inner tri triangle, so it's completely different, but they're not in the market. They produced a few and they went out of business, so don't be afraid of the gotcha handcuffs. But from a design point of view, uh, using the gear, it still seems, you know, completely takes away the fact of shimming it. Yeah, you can't shim the gotchas, but uh, the, you can ca copy a key. I could 3D print a key for the gotchas, I guess. Yeah. Anything else, or should we start packing up all this steel and, and let you play with it next door? One last question, then we got to go next door. What type of Dremel bit? I found that the wheels, you know those little brown wheels that snap and break all the time? They're too wide. They make a special diamond wheel that they call a cutoff wheel. It's like, you know, like 15 bucks. That tends to be narrower. That's, that's a better one to use for the slot. Or like a really thin hacksaw blade if you've got, you know, steady hands and not up drinking. Is that it? Are we good? Going next door? Okay, we're going to go next door. Thank you very much.